Welcome to part two of the video in which we analyze a switch mode boost converter. In part one, as you'll hopefully recall, we uh, talked about the overall picture of a uh, boost mode uh, converter. We talked about how um, the actual boost circuit is uh, embedded in a controller that keeps the output voltage at a value that we want it to be. In this video, we will actually analyze the boost converter circuit to understand the relationship between the input voltage Vn, the output voltage V out, and the duty cycle of the pulse width modulated switch uh, waveform. So this is a picture or a uh, schematic of the boost uh, converter circuit. You can see that it correspond or that it consists of an inductor, a diode, a capacitor, a load, and a switch. The switch, uh, the switch, uh, opens and closes uh, with a rate of typically between about 50 kilohertz to well above several megahertz. And the switch will also open and close with a duty cycle that uh, affects the relationship between Vn and Vout. So to show this, we'll put a timeline here. And we'll set capital T to be the period of the uh, uh, rate at which the switch opens and closes. And we'll set DT to be the length of time that the switch is closed. So D here is the duty cycle. And we'll assume that D is between 0 and 1. So that between 0 and DT, the switch is closed. And between DT and T, the switch is open. Now, again, our goal is to analyze how this circuit works uh, as the switch opens and closes. And again, to understand the relationship between V in, V out, and D. We will make some assumptions in order to do this. First, we'll assume that the capacitor C is large relative to currents and so on that are, um, that are uh, moving around through the circuit. And this will imply that the capacitor voltage doesn't change much. Now, the way it's set up, the capacitor voltage is the same as V out, so we're assuming that V out doesn't change. Um, we'll assume that the capacitor is initially charged to V out, so that we don't have to worry about how the capacitor gets to V out. Okay. We will also assume that the current through the inductor, which we'll denote I sub L, we'll assume that at time zero, when the switch first goes from being opened to being closed, we'll assume that the current is zero. Now, this is an assumption that makes the analysis a little easier to understand, but it turns out to not be a particularly realistic assumption. By the time we're done, though, we'll show how we can uh, eliminate this assumption and not change uh, the way in which the circuit works. And we'll also assume that we have an ideal diode. which means that when the diode is forward biased, it looks like a wire. And when the uh, diode is reverse biased, it looks like an open circuit. So we're not going to worry about any internal resistance that the diode may have. And we will not worry about um, the voltage drop, uh, the forward biased voltage drop that you would see in a rail diode. Uh, again, these are all assumptions that we can relax in order to have things make sense. Uh, well, that we can relax later in order to have things become more realistic. Okay, so 
let's see what happens then at time zero when my switch goes from being open to being closed. Okay. Now the first thing you should note is that as soon as I close the switch, this note up here is the same as what is essentially our reference node um, that our uh, the negative terminal of our source is connected to. And since uh, we assume that the capacitor starts off charged to V out, which we'll assume is positive, then um, the capacitor volt, or I'm sorry, the diode voltage is plus to negative, which means that the diode is reversed bias, and with the switch closed, we can treat the diode then as just an open circuit. Okay, and again, that's we can do that because the diode is reversed, reversed biased. So really all we need to do in order to understand what's happening to begin with is uh, understand what's happening to the inductor current. If we look at the voltage across the inductor, we'll label it this way, we see that that voltage across the inductor We'll uh, get rid of our assumptions now, make ourselves some space to work. So we see that the voltage across the inductor is equal to the input voltage. Again, because this node is, is common to both voltage sources, and this node through the switch is also common to both voltage sources. You will recall that the voltage across an inductor is L times the derivative of the inductor current with respect to time. Now since the voltage across the inductor is Vn, Vn, which we're assuming is constant, and L is constant, we have that dIl dt is equal to Vn over L. In other words, the uh, rate at which the current through the inductor changes is constant. It's Vn over L. So if we graph the inductor current as a function of time, from the point where the switch closes to d times t, our inductor current is going to look like a straight line. And it will have the slope given by v in over l. Okay, well actually, we'll redraw this in red to indicate that this is what happens during the time that the switch is closed. Okay, so to summarize, what happens when the switch is closed is that the inductor current starts at zero and ramps up to some value. The value that the inductor current ramps up to, which I guess if I were a better artist these lines would meet, you can see that I have a length of time dt and I have a slope of Vn over L. So the inductor current at time dt has ramped up to a value of Vn over L dt. Okay, so this basically then tells us what's happened to the inductor current at this point. Rather than open the switch and see what happens after we open the switch and try to do it really fast, I think we'll stop this video at this point and the next video, part three, will show what happens when we open the switch in terms of the inductor current and then we'll talk a little bit about power at Vn and Vout and uh, average currents and so on.
So we'll stop this video at this point and uh, look forward to talking to you again in the third part.